I'm Kara Legbo, historian for Oakland County Parks. Join me now for an episode of History in Our Parks. The Key in the Wall in Hattie's House. An Independence Oaks County Park story. This little house was once located in Independence Oaks County Park. It was a small house, just 24 feet by 16 feet and only one and a half stories tall. It was located here in the northeastern corner of the park. The house was located here, right at the corner of Oak Hill and Sasha Bomb. Because of its location, it became a casualty of a new roundabout planned for that intersection. Because of its location, it had to be removed. Oakland County Parks had previously done an extensive evaluation of the house. And although it was over 100 years old, little evidence of its age was left. A bay window had been added. Other windows had been removed. It had been altered and modified. Vinyl siding had replaced the original clapboard siding. And the old field stone foundation had been covered with concrete. An extensive fire in the 1980s had gutted the inside. And according to the architect who evaluated the house, the interior has been altered, erasing any evidence of its original design, features, and materials. In other words, the house had lost its historical significance. And it was sitting in the way of a new roundabout. Removal was the only option. But if we couldn't preserve the house, at least we could preserve the history of it. And more importantly, the story of the people who once called it home. As Parks historian, that became my job. I discovered that the house showed up on the 1896 map of Independence Township. But it was not there on the 1872 map. So likely it was built sometime between 1872 and 1896. The house had been built on the 25-acre farm of Franklin Bailey. Franklin was one of the 10 sons of William and Clarissa Bailey. The Bailey family farm was located in what today is Independence North. Franklin's farm would be carved out of the northern part of the family farm. In 1881, Franklin married Hattie Slocum. He was 27 at the time, and she was just 16. Over the next few years, they had several children, Alfred, Joseph, Bessie, and Burden, and sadly one child who didn't survive. The 1900 census shows them living in the little house on the corner. A pretty big family for such a small house. And sadly, difficult times were just on the horizon. Franklin appears to have struggled with mental issues much of his life and was committed to the Eastern Michigan Asylum in Pontiac shortly after 1900, leaving Hattie to care for not only the farm, but her children. He was scheduled to be released in 1903. Hattie, however, talked to the doctors and told them she wasn't sure he was ready to come home yet. But despite her fears, he was released from the hospital. He returned to the house on the corner and his family. On the morning of April 19, 1903, while his family was sleeping, Franklin went down to the small lake 
that bordered his farm. Later that morning, his rowboat was found floating in the lake along with the old felt hat he always wore. Early newspaper articles reported that he had committed suicide by drowning. Later, an inquest said that it was actually heart failure. We'll probably never know what really happened. But Hattie was left a widow with four children. And like most widows at that time, she remarried. In 1905, Hattie married Norman Locke. She was 39 at the time, and he was 28. Norman moved in to the little house on the corner. They had two children, Ruby and Earl. Sadly, Earl died at age two in 1911. The cause of death, pneumonia. And Ruby died when she was only 22 in 1927, when she was involved in a serious auto accident. She left behind two children, one age five and one age two. The 1930 census shows the two children being raised by their grandparents, Hattie and Norman Locke. Hattie had experienced a lot of sorrow in her life, the loss of a husband, the loss of children, but she also had her joys. I learned that she loved her little farm and gardening. The Oxford Leader newspaper had several articles that I found that mentioned some of her farming achievements. Like her gooseberries that were said to be the largest berries ever grown in the vicinity. And her cucumber that measured 22 inches. And the 10 foot sunflower that she took to the newspaper, presenting it to them one September and saying that it was the first Christmas tree of the season for them. That same newspaper also reported the serious automobile accident that Hattie was involved in. The car had been demolished. Hattie spent several weeks in Pontiac General Hospital. A less resilient person would have probably succumbed to such serious injuries as she had, but not Hattie. The 1940 census showed her back in her little house with her family. Hattie died on May 1st, 1942, when she was 76 years old. Cause of death listed as hypertension and cerebral hemorrhage. According to her death certificate, Hattie died at home in the little corner house where she had lived for over 60 years. After Hattie's death, Norman kept the farm for a while, but then sold it to the Barrett family. That family owned the land that had surrounded the small farm. The house then had a series of renters. But I will always think of the house as Hattie's house. After all, she had lived in it for over 60 years. I had the opportunity to visit the house one final time on the day before it was removed. I wanted to take a few pieces of the wall to examine the layers of wallpaper that might be there and to see the interior construction of the house. And while I did that, I made an amazing discovery. Hidden inside one of the walls, hanging from a small nail, was a key. What had the key been for? Why had it been hidden in the wall? And who had hidden the key? All mysteries. 
I like to think that it was Hattie who left that little key behind for me to find. To help unlock the story of her family and her little house on the corner.